Hello and welcome back to Archetype Builds. This is the channel where we usually take a look at a stereotype, maybe a paragon of a given fantasy uh, archetype. But today we are talking about ranking the subclasses. This is part of our ongoing class ranking series where we rank every subclass according to how it fits each of the seven roles in the party. That being the frontliner, the beatdown, the support, the utility, the negotiator, the infiltrator, and the investigator. Today we're talking about the Paladin and Paladin subclasses. To kick us off, we're going to start with Oath of the Ancients. Oath of the Ancients is getting two channel divinities at level 3 when you get your subclass. The first one is going to be a nature-themed ability that allows you to wrap enemies in uh, vines and restrain them. This is great battlefield utility. This is the definition of a utility feature. And uh, our next ability, Turn the Faithless, is also utility, right? It's going to have that Turn the Undead feature, but for both uh, Undead and Fiends. This might indicate a strong utility bonus. However, the issue with Channel Divinities is that you get usually once per short rest, which is a relatively small number of Channel Divinities. Especially since all of these require saving throws from enemies, some of those enemies will save, some won't, and you've blown your one channel divinity for the combat. So, it's kind of lackluster utility. The other thing that's frustrating is, Battlefield Utility is one of the most competitive areas to rank up in, because it requires so many different options in order to cover a lot of the bases. Then, Paladins don't get anything until their Aura at level 7. Level 7 for both of the Ancients is going to give us the Aura of Warding. Aura of Warding is going to reduce damage taken from spells to any creature within 30 feet of you by half, which is amazing. It's a very strong feature. This means when your opponent lays down a Fireball, or God forbid, a Meteor Swarm, or a Noxious Cloud, um, your allies, even if they fail their saves, are going to take half damage from that. Ooh. Your allies are going to take half damage from that spell effect, which is really great. Preventing damage to allies is the definition of a frontliner. That's what the role is all about. But we do have to ask the question, how consistently will this be used? And when it is used, how impactful is that? So we know that creatures can do damage in primarily two forms. One is a, uh, an attack, right? An actual, like, making the attack roll and dealing damage. The other is through spells, uh, and this helps with the latter category. But there's also environmental effects. Monster abilities that require saving throws but aren't spells, like, like a glare or a beholder's eye stock. Um, there are um, hazards and traps that, that don't have anything to do with this. Uh, and there are some spells which cause effects which deal indirect damage or, or shift the party or have battlefield utility. So damage from damaging spells is not a majority or even a large portion of damage that is dealt to D&D parties. Still, when it happens, it's going to be amazing, right? Well, everyone's got to be standing within 30 feet of you. So... One counter to Fireball is to spread out, right? Or to Meteor Swarm or something. A lot of the damaging spells often are going to hit an area of effect or like a line like Lightning Bolt. So being needing to group up in order to get this benefit also making you vulnerable to the exact type of spells that this is helping to mitigate feels like a little bit of a two steps forward, one step back. The result is, this is clearly good, and a lot of people talk about it being like an amazing feature. And I do think it is good. I don't think that you could even pretend like this makes Oath of Ancients an S-tier uh, frontliner. It's, it's nowhere close. It's a nice feature, but it's going to reduce you know X amount of damage over the course of the game. Whereas if you had the ability to just concentrate the enemy's attacks on you, 
you're going to prevent far more, far more consistently. The next ability I'm going to talk about is the 15th level Undying Sentinel, which is basically the orc's racial feature, right? The ability to bounce back up from zero hit points once per long rest. I mean, Shadow Sorcerers get this at level one. It, it's such a sad 15th level feature. Um, it is good for frontliners. But this is yeah, quite boring. And then I'm not going to spend time in this video talking about the 20th level features, in part because they all have so many little bullet points and clauses and implications and are these crazy, over-the-top, amazing capstones. But they are 20th level. I'm not weighting them in any way, shape, or form into how this subclass generally performs its functions. Next up is the Conquest Paladin that is going to get also two channel divinity options at third level. The Conquest Paladin is going to get Conquering Presence, which basically sends out a fear effect to everyone around you, uh, forcing them to make a saving throw or become frightened of you. Very similar to like a turn effect, um, but this has the benefit of working on just about everybody within 30 feet, which is a really nice opening up the options for that utility. And then also we are going to have some synergy with the Frightened Condition later on in this class. We also have the option to use our Channel Divinity for a Guided Strike, giving us a plus 10 to hit on one attack roll if you like really need to land that smite and just like do a big chunk of damage. This is a very good option for being able to do that. It Again, it suffers from the fact that you're getting one Channel Divinity per short rest. So like it, if you're making that one strike, it had better count if you're using your Channel Divinity on it. And if you're using Conquering Presence, right, you're going to hope that those people uh, fail their saving throw. Because if a lot of them succeed, you haven't done much with one of your key class features. Probably worth noting as well at this point that um, Paladins more so than even, I think, rangers or artificers or other half-casters are going to be multiple ability score dependent. The reason why is because you are almost always a frontliner. You do get that heavy armor proficiency. You are encouraged with a lot of their abilities to be in the melee rather than back. And that means you cannot short your constitution uh, even if you want to. A ranger with a high dexterity and a high wisdom can get away with a lesser constitution. A paladin cannot. So your charisma is very unlikely to be higher than a plus three or plus four at any point in the campaign. This means that your saving throw is not going to be as high as it would be for a full spellcaster. So channel divinities that force a saving throw we have to look at it and say, like, there's a 5 to 10% greater chance that they'll succeed than we would account for most characters. This is going to bring us to Aura of Conquest. We read, You emanate a menacing aura while you're not incapacitated. It extends 10 feet from you in every direction. If a creature is frightened of you, its speed is reduced to zero while in the aura, and it takes psychic damage equal to half your paladin level if it starts its turn there. So, what this is doing... If they are frightened of you, there are no effects that I can tell in the game that make someone frightened of someone else. So this is only from effects that you are casting. Either you are casting the fear spell, or you're using your channel divinity, or you are using some other class feature to frighten opponents. That is what this is saying. If you do that, they cannot move, and they take a little bit of psychic damage. Um, Half your Paladin level, it's not bad, but like even at 7th level, dealing 3 damage per turn is is not great either. You know what I mean? Like like if you go up to 10th level, the, you look at CR creatures at that level, like they are shrugging off 3 second damage pretty consistently. So the main thing here is movement restriction. If they're frightened of you, they cannot move. Why does this matter? Well, creatures that are frightened of you, if they are within line of sight, have disadvantage on their attack rolls. So you are preventing them from getting out of line of sight and running away. That's very good. Um, a lot of fear effects include the stipulation that you must use your turn to run away. And so if you must use your turn to run away and your movement speed is zero, you do nothing on your turn. That's very good. But of course, the main thing here is if they're frightened of you, 
and you don't want them to run off and attack the wizard instead, right? You're the paladin. Um, you want to be drawing enemies' attention and locking them down. And this is a really effective lockdown feature. So when you talk about frontlining, being able to stop enemies from moving away from you and potentially eating up their turns with your channel divinity and aura, very, very effective frontlining. Combined with the Paladin's existing heavy armor proficiency and abilities to like self-heal, I think you're looking at a really top tier uh, frontliner in the Conquest Paladin. Scornful Rebuke is fun. Uh, you do damage to people who hit you. Damage is equal to your Charisma modifier, and it is psychic damage, which is nice. Like I mentioned, your Charisma modifier is not likely to be higher than a 3 or 4, and at 15th level, that's pretty negligible damage, but nice. You're sort of trying to goad enemies into the situation where attacking someone else is impossible because they are locked down, but attacking you is just going to result in, in bad stuff. And so you're, you're trying to uh, crush any attempt that they might make to fight back. Uh, I think the most likely issue with this class is that you're going to see people succeed on their saving throw against fear. You're going to see people making ranged attacks, even from within your aura. And I think you're going to see people avoid attacking you because they routinely get damaged when they do that. So, you know, as a frontliner, you want people to attack you. And if you can make them do that, this Scornful Rebuke is, is a very helpful bonus to damage. But it's also a disincentive for them to attack you, right? When your DM is role-playing those characters, attacking you seems to hurt. There's no reason you're, you're like a, a stupid beast or something like that wouldn't feel that and go, oh, I don't feel like attacking him anymore. So it's almost like an antithesis of the frontliner feature. So, so far we've talked about two Paladin subclasses, and neither one of them have changed the rank of the Paladin baseline. That's because the Paladin baseline is very, very good. It's got the more A tiers than any other baseline. Um, it's a really phenomenal class. It's very difficult to push that further. The Oath of the Crown is a subclass that is also going to look at being that like frontliner support hybrid that the Paladin does so well. Your channel divinity options at level 3 are going to be champion challenge. If they fail your saving throw, the creature can't willingly move more than 30 feet away from you. That's the only effect. Just can't move away from you. Doesn't say it must attack you. Doesn't say it has disadvantage to attack other people. I guess if you can get them isolated and then issue this challenge and then hope they don't succeed on the saving throw, then yes, you've tanked one creature with your channel divinity. Your other option is Turn the Tide. I think this is mathematically a much better option. This says, as a bonus action, you can bolster injured creatures with your channel divinity. Everyone that can hear you within 30 feet gains 1d6 plus your charisma modifier. You just regained hit points. So this is like, like healing that's going out. Again, charisma modifier, you're lucky if it's a plus 3 at this level. Let's call it a plus 3. d6 is, on average, uh, 3.5. So that's 6 healing. To everyone within 30 feet of you as your channel divinity. That is not going to scale very well because your charisma is not going up by very much and the dice is not going to scale. So that's that's your thing that you get to do. It's a little boop of healing, like a mass healing word. Our seventh level aura is Divine Allegiance. This allows us to swap ourself out for an ally when they get hit with an attack. Specifically, it says takes damage, so you can do this for spell effects, you can do this for traps and other stuff like that. Um, this is essentially the heroic, like, jumping in front of the bullet effect, which is very cinematic and very cool. Uh, it does take reaction. It must be an ally within five feet, so you've got to be right next to them to do it. Uh, and then, the other limitation is the damage can't be reduced or prevented in any way. So. Essentially, if your ally was going to have resistance to the damage type, or if, you know, uh, if you have resistance to that damage type, or your armor class is higher than their armor class, so, you know, the attack wouldn't hit you, doesn't matter. You're taking the full damage regardless. And that's probably not that big of a limitation. I think that's, that's kind of reasonable. It's true for another Paladin subclass we will look at today. Um, but overall, I think that this is relatively 
Overall, I think this is relatively weak. Um, as a frontliner, you do want to take the damage on yourself rather than your ally. But you also generally make yourself pretty good at not taking a lot of damage. So having a higher armor class, you know, having building up resistances to things, being able to reduce damage to yourself, healing, um, and and to have to take the full damage. And the other thing is it's gotta be within five feet of you. So if you're in the melee, you're talking about like this guy or this guy. Like that's it. Like, that's all you have the ability to prevent. Um, if it was a much larger radius, I think maybe we'd be cooking, uh, but relatively weak for a reaction. Unyielding Spirit uh, at 15th level gives you advantage on saving throws to prevent paralyzed or stunned conditions, which is really, really good. Like, like those are conditions you do not want. Not having those conditions, amazing for all characters, frontliners especially. It's a great feature. Is at 15th level. So... We're looking at an okay frontliner. We can prevent damage to our allies every once in a while if they're next to us. And we can heal for a little bit, once per short rest. And at a high level, we are unlikely to be paralyzed or stunned. That's that's an A tier if I've ever heard one in my entire life. That's the most A tier level, right in the middle, as a 95% um, out of 110. All right, Oath of Devotion, uh, the vanilla of Paladin Oaths. The Oath of Devotion is going to have Sacred Weapon, which allows you to enchant your weapon. You're going to uh, be allowed to add your Charisma bonus to hit on attack rolls with the weapon that you have zapped with your Channel Divinity. This is, like I said, probably on average going to be a plus three to hit. Plus three to hit. Nothing to, nothing to Sneeze that. That's uh, better than most fighting styles. Very likely to hit on a consistent basis if you do this. Again, this is once per short rest, so you're probably, that's your channel divinity for the combat. Uh, if you choose not to do it, you have Turn the Unholy, which only works on Fiends and Undead. So, it maybe you're on one of those campaigns. You know, situationally useful. Situational utility. I'd say generally you're in a sacred weapon. Uh, and be, I guess, a beatdown of the party if you've got these options. At 7th level, you get Aura of Devotion, which is where this class falls off hard. Now, you and uh, allies within 10 feet of you can't be Charmed. Charmed condition is not especially common. It does happen. Absolutely. Um, the limitation of 10 feet of you is a little frustrating here. Yeah, it, and that's all it does. So it's just, it's relatively weak. And then our 15th level, Purity of Spirit. You are always under the effects of the protection from good and evil spell, which is actually very, very cool. Gives you protection against aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead. Creatures of those types have disadvantage on attack rolls, and you can't be charmed or frightened or possessed by them. I mean, that's a lot of creature types. Like, don't, like, that's a sizable chunk of the enemy population. And a disadvantage to hit you is great, right? It's going to reduce the chance that, that you get knocked out. Like I mentioned in the last one, it doesn't make you a particularly good frontliner because enemies are going to see, oh, I have a really hard time hitting you. You're under this protection from good and evil. Let me go and hit one of your allies, right? But if you are the beatdown of the party and you're adding your plus three, plus four to hit on, a, on each weapon attack, um, maybe you don't want to get hit. Maybe this is very beneficial to you, right? And now you're not going to be charmed or frightened. Significant overlap with that level seven feature, by the way. Um, the charming thing, that's uh, lame. But, you know, this is good. So what does this speak to? I think this speaks to a tier damage dealer. It's got some abilities that increase its ability to do damage and let it survive long enough to do that damage. Have you noticed that most of the paladin subclasses just don't increase the total baseline? Yeah, it's, it's a theme. Here we are on the Oath of Glory. Let's see what changes here. The Oath of Glory is going to give you Peerless Athlete, which is going to give you Advantage on athletics and acrobatics checks. You can push, carry, pull, drag, lift twice the normal weight. You jump, your jump's better. So you, you, you can jump. 
So what you're probably going to use is Inspiring Smite, which after you deal damage to a creature with your Divine Smite, you can use your Channel Divinity as a bonus action to distribute temporary hit points to the creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you. The total number of hit points is equal to 2d8 plus your level in this class. That's pretty good. A 2d8 is going to be 9 on average, and your level in this class, you're starting here at 3, so it's 12 temporary hit points at level 3. That's pretty good. And then it scales nicely with your level, which we love. You can distribute these hit points as you want to, which is great flexibility. I really like it. I think it's quite good. It's, it is kind of a support feature, right? It, boosting people up with these temporary hit points. But yeah, nothing wrong with a little bit of extra dash of support in your paladin. At 7th level, you're getting the Aura of Alacrity, which is going to give you and your companions supernatural speed. Uh, your walking speed increases by 10 feet, and anyone who is within 5 feet of you when they start their turn also has 10 more feet of walking speed. I find this to be extremely situational and not all that helpful. Um, it is uh, has a frustrating inability to be quantified by a lot of the mathematical tools that we have. When we look at combat encounters, we have to ask the question, um, you know, two cases. Did my existing movement speed get me where I needed to be? And if the answer is no, then does 10 more feet of movement speed get me there? And so it's this very thin wedge where, like, if it if you take your 10 more feet and still didn't make it to where you needed to go, that wasn't helpful. If you made it where you need to go with your 30 feet or 35 feet, that wasn't helpful. So it's a very thin range of helpfulness. And that's if positioning even matters in this given combat, whatever you're doing. So I think it's pretty situational. 15th level, Glorious Defense is going to give you this cool reaction. When you or another creature you can see within 30 feet of you are hit by an attack, you can grant a bonus to the target's AC equal to your Charisma modifier. So probably at 15th level, that's a 3 or a 4. If the attack misses, you can make a weapon attack against the attacker as part of this reaction if they're within reach. So, again, you're talking about um, being like in the melee and stuff happening in the melee like right next to you. This also probably encourages like a pull-arm style paladin because... Uh, Right, your reach is a little bit further. You've got a, a wider swath of people you can do this to. Uh, the extra attack is pretty cool. The the like little charisma shield that you give someone is pretty cool. You can do this a number of times equal to your charisma modifier. So that's better than once, you know, uh, like some other classes. I think it's pretty good. It's pretty good frontline and beatdown. Oh, the Oathbreaker Paladin, the most edgelord of Paladin subclasses. That's including Vengeance. It's more edgelord than Vengeance at me. Control Undead is uh, your channel divinity at third level. This is going to give you the ability to um, try and take control of an undead. They make a wisdom saving throw, and on a failed save, they obey the Paladin's commands for the next 24 hours. And of course, because you get you know one channel divinity per short rest, you can re-up this, you know, towards the end of that 24 hours. The next thing you're going to get is Dreadful Aspect, which is, again, another, like, big fear effect. Each creature of the Paladin's choice within 30 feet makes Wisdom save. If they fail, they're frightened of the Paladin. So that's neat utility and very consistent with the other Channel of Enemies that we see. Of course, taking control of an undead, pretty situational. Our Aura of Hate at 7th level is going to give Fiends and Undead within 10 feet of the Paladin a bonus to uh, damage equal to the Charisma modifier of the Paladin. This essentially means if there are any Fiends or Undead around, they are stronger. Are those your Undead or Fiends? I guess you better make sure that they are, because if you're in a campaign where there's a lot of Undead for you to use your Control Undead on, the Undead that are not under your control are going to get that bonus to the attack. What this does speak to is if you are using your class spells to animate dead and then sending them into battle with you and they're all getting a bonus to their attacks, that's going to be very cool. Uh, and it's going to deal a lot of damage. But it's not going to deal as much damage as a wizard casting that because you are a half caster. So those spell slots are very valuable to you. It's very hard to do the thing that wizards do, which is like create undead, reassert control over them, raise more undead, reassert control over them. Very spell slot intensive, right? So 
it's hard for you to break into anything other than A tier in damage, even with this ability and animate undead on your spell list. Supernatural resistance is obviously an amazing feature. Resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons. Just great, great stuff. It's the bear totem barbarian, um, almost, makes you a good frontliner, but there's nothing else that we've seen so far that makes you a good frontliner. So that, in and of itself, 15th level is not going to cut it. All right, the Oath of Redemption Paladin. Now, this is one of my favorite Paladin subclasses, and you'll see why. At third level, our two channel divinities are firstly, Emissary of Peace. As a bonus action, you grant yourself a plus five to Charisma Persuasion checks for the next 10 minutes. So before we move on to the next one, here's what I really like about this. It's a non-combat channel divinity. Um, so just like the Oath of Glory's Peerless Athlete, it's very probable that you will be able to channel divinity in this situation, short rest, and have your channel divinity for the next fight. So it takes a situation where you're sort of letting a channel divinity go to waste because it's not useful in a non-combat scenario and giving you an outlet for it. But unlike the Oath of Glory, a persuasion check is going to come up all the time. And being a negotiator is something a paladin is predisposed to do because they're already supposed to have a decent charisma score. If you are looking to create a persuader, negotiator character, having a plus five kind of on demand for important negotiations is really, really good. Add on to that a three or a four for your charisma uh, modifier and just grab proficiency. You're probably talking a plus 10 to your persuasion rolls pretty easily which is very, very nice. The other one that you're going to get is Rebuke the Violent. This is a reaction-based channel divinity, which says immediately after an attacker within 30 feet of you deals damage with an attack, you can use a reaction to force the attacker to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail the save, they take radiant damage equal to the damage it just dealt. And it takes half damage on a successful save. So what we're looking at here is a reaction-based damage dealing where you can respond to the biggest attacks on the battlefield from your enemies and deal that damage back. That is an extremely effective reaction. So once per turn, you're going to be able to deal a bunch of damage to the person who deals a bunch of damage. That's really great. If the seventh level aura of the Guardian looks familiar to you, that's because we talked about a very similar aura just a couple subclasses ago with the crown. This is the same deal. You substitute yourself can't reduce the damage in any way. Two major exceptions. The first exception is that the range is 10 feet instead of 5 feet. Seems small. It's actually quite big. When you talk about the melee, the melee is rarely a 2x2 two two grid of squares, right? Or even like a 3x3 three three grid of squares. Often, you've got a bunch of people all mixed up in it. Large creatures are taking up these big blocks. The, the extra leeway you get by being able to look at the 5x5 five five grid of the battlefield, rather than just the 3x3 three three of what's immediately around you, is very likely to come up in how often you can exercise this ability. The other thing is, it specifically states it doesn't carry over any other effects that might accompany the damage, like status effects, uh, maybe knocking someone prone, or uh, potentially like poisoning them. None of these are going to go through, or a grapple. This, especially given that it's a reaction ability, you know which enemies can do stuff like that. And you can just negate that part of their attack. Maybe it doesn't matter to you whether the damage is on them or on you. Maybe you're not the frontliner. Still, it might be beneficial to do this to kind of negate an enemy's stunning strike or a snake's like like constrictor move. I think this is incredibly more useful than the crown's exact same feature. Um, does it make you a good frontliner? Not really, but it helps. At 15th level, protective spirit is going to give you a regeneration rate. If you end the turn with fewer than half your hit points, uh, you're going to regenerate 1d6 plus half your paladin level. Now, at this high level, half your paladin level, we're talking like 7. So D6, that's on average about 10 HP when you end your turn with less than half health. 
as a frontliner, if you're taking damage from enemies, you are um, going to regularly get below half health, and then this is going to help keep you bolstered and alive, along with hopefully your allies chipping in as well. Um, if you work hard on your armor class, then by the time you get to half health, the rate of damage might be low enough that this regeneration rate is making a significant dent in that. Overall, I love the Redemption Paladin for its synergy with the Negotiator role and with the Frontlining role. I think this is, this is an S-tier Negotiator, and I actually do think that it's an S-tier Frontliner as well. Um, being able to call on the Paladin's spell list to get um, things like Compel to Duel to increase the rate at which you can taunt, substituting your own health over a wider swath of the battlefield, and generally that, that regeneration rate, kicking it at a high level, um, but is going to significantly increase the length at which you can prolong a combat. And now, for the Oath of Vengeance. This is going to give you Abjure Enemy, which is going to target a single enemy. They make a wisdom saving throw, and if they fail, they are frightened. However, they are frightened for one minute or until it takes damage. Even on a successful uh, save against the, the saving throw, its speed is reduced by half. So this is potentially significant in combats against a single enemy, which it's D&D, you're gonna have a couple boss fights, and this might be useful. Vow of Enmity, however, is the signature channel divinity for this class, and the one you'll probably be using most often. You utter a Vow of Enmity against a creature you can see within 10 feet of you. Using your channel divinity, you gain advantage on attack rolls against that creature for one minute, or until it drops to zero. So this is unlimited, on-demand advantage against one creature in a combat. Again, you're gonna have boss fights. It's D&D. It's going to happen. So this is an incredibly helpful boost to your damage, um, seriously accelerating the rate at which you hit and continue to deal your damage. Paladins already, as a martial class, get access to things like Great Open Master, Whole Arm Master, you know, all these other things, and then continuously having advantage on attack rolls against your target is just going to make it much, much more impactful. Our seventh level feature kind of helps balance the class a little bit. A Relentless Avenger says that when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, you can move up to half your speed immediately after the attack, uh, and this movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. The way that this is phrased, closing off your foe's retreat, is it indicates that you would be like a, an enemy would be running away and then they provoke opportunity attacks and then you like circle around to the other side of them, which seems quite niche. And you might notice this isn't an aura, right? So that's not an aura effect. This is just a thing you do now on opportunity attacks. I think this is situationally helpful. It's not that great overall, which would really hurts the subclass to have a seventh level feature that's kind of lackluster like that. But the 15th level feature, Soul of Vengeance, is going to seriously redeem this subclass in my eyes. This says that when the subject of your Vow of Enmity makes an attack roll, you can make a reaction attack uh, against that creature. So this is giving you another potential use for your reaction, right? Instead of doing, um, uh, it doesn't say it's an opportunity attack, right? It says you can use your action to make a way melee weapon attack. So it's not triggering your 7th level aura. It'd be nice if those had synergy, but whatever. There is, like, now you are consistently getting your reaction. Because the person standing to fight, you get your reaction attack. If the person is running away, you get your reaction attack. Yeah, you're very well buttoned up on your reaction. Again, that means that whatever you're doing on your turn, plus an additional attack from your reaction, you're frequently making more attacks than other people, all of them at advantage if your Vow of Enmity is working. Very, very powerful single target damage dealer. And the great thing about a single target damage dealer is that there's always at least a single target, right? It's not it doesn't feel good if you are fighting a colony of goblins, there's like 30 of them, and you Vow of Enmity 1. It's not great. Maybe you choose the leader, maybe you choose the spellcaster, you know, whatever. 
you'll reduce them to zero hit points relatively quickly, but like you were gonna have to attack someone anyway. It's nice to get these bonuses. And if you are up against a big, you know, giant uh in, in a in a four on one combat, or you're up against, you know, a single vampire in in you know his castle, this these scenarios are so common and it's so good to be able to excel in those kind of combats. The wizard will deal with the goblins. That's fine. That's always going to be true. But you, as a as a melee paladin, get to be the damage dealer for boss fights. And that's amazing. And as a result, I have to give it an S tier. This is a perfect subclass to build a beatdown class around. Lastly, we're talking Watchers. Our channel divinities here from Watchers are Watchers Will, which says uh, you can choose a number of creatures you see within 30 feet of you, equal to your charisma modifier, but assume this is your party. Um, for one minute, you and the chosen creatures have advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. So many scenarios where this might be relevant. I feel like in combination with like some metagame knowledge, this is an absolutely OP channel divinity. Even without, if you let the combat go for a little bit, you can kind of see like, oh, this is a creature that's causing a lot of wisdom saving throws. Like, let me pop this out to protect my team. You know, oh, we're entering a mind flare layer. I don't want a metagame. Let me wait for just a little bit. Like, oh, okay, intelligence saving throws, like, boom, I'll just throw this out, and now for the rest of the combat, we don't have to worry. Um, very, very useful in a large number of scenarios. The The breadth of intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws is, is pretty wide. You're also going to get Abjure the Extra Planer, which is a little bit like Turn the Faithless, but it is significantly better. So you're going to be able to present your holy symbol and Aberration, Celestial, Elemental, Fey, or Fiends within 30 feet of you make a wisdom saving throw. Um, and are turned for one minute if they fail. This is a much bigger selection, which makes this a much better channel divinity than those other ones. Um, in terms of like how useful is the utility from this, four or five times what the channel divinity is for other paladin subclasses. So this class is doing very well in the area of utility and support. The Aura of the Stars is an incredible aura. Those standing next to the paladin within 10 feet gain a bonus to the initiative equal to your proficiency bonus. This is a 3 right now, and it's going to go up to a 4 at level 9. Um, so if you're playing in that mid-range, late-range campaign, a plus 4 to initiative is really good. I mean, there are very few comparable abilities. Um, but, like, the Twilight Current gives you advantage. Advantage, mathematically, is going to be around a plus five. So, like, we're talking that, but for the entire party. Like, a whole class feature, but for the entire party. Very good. And the reason I say the entire party is, I don't know how your games work at your D&D table, but in my games, almost always, when combat breaks out, the DM's like, all right, where's everybody standing? And what do you say? We're all standing together next to the paladin. It, I feel like more combats than, than not, this is going to trigger for everybody. So everybody getting a plus four means you go sooner, you know, you, and you don't just go sooner on the first turn, right? When you think about it, once everything is said and done at the end of the first round, you're going, you're going first on the next round and going first on the round after that. So this has this continued benefit from this one initiative role. I actually, I think this is quite good in terms of like party support and then vigilant rebuke is a bit of a weird one uh it's very similar to rebuke the violent actually from the redemption paladin what you're going to do is uh you see whenever you or a creature you can see within 30 feet succeeds on an intelligence wisdom or charisma saving throw you can use your reaction to deal damage to the person that caused the save damage uh being able to 2d8 plus your charisma modifier Let's assume at 15th level, we're talking like 13 damage. 13 damage for a reaction is okay. Um, there's no limit here. So there have been other ones that have been like pretty decent uh, 15th level features and had a limit of like charisma modifier or like proficiency bonus. This is just whenever that happens. 
and you use your reaction. I think that's quite good, and obviously it is intended to pair super well with that channel divinity that is going to give you advantage on, on those saving throws in the first place. So, love that. Very good class, like, synergy there. That's very fun. Um, anti, the anti-saving throw class. Fascinating. So that was the Paladin. Um, a huge slate of Paladin subclasses that had no effect on the baseline, and then a couple S-tier Paladin subclasses um, in various roles, from frontlining to support and negotiation. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and I will be back next week with another build video.